Okay. Hi, everyone. I am Christine Schwartz. I'm the CEO of Service to School. Thanks for joining us this evening. I think that I've had the pleasure of meeting some of you before, and I see a bunch of familiar faces and names, so glad to spend the evening with you. Um, I think you all mostly know about Service to School. Hopefully that's how you heard about this webinar, but our mission is to help transitioning veterans and service members get into the best colleges and graduate schools possible. Um, so we are excited to help you on that journey as you apply to law school, as you think about applying to law school and you uh, make that next step. You know, you transition from service member to full-time student and go on and do great things. Um, so I'm going to hand the mic over to both Miriam and Christy. Uh, Miriam Ingber is the Associate Dean of Admissions at Yale Law School, and Christy Jobson is the Assistant Dean for Admissions at Harvard Law School. And we are going to have kind of more of a casual fireside chat. They're going to um, address some questions that were already sent in, and then you also may drop questions into the chat box chat box throughout the course of the evening and I'll moderate those and we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. So those could be very specific to each school's admission process, to cultures, to veterans on campus, whatever that might be. Um, so take it away, Miriam. Hello everyone. Yes, Josiah, if it's an official name change to Josiah Miriam Parkas, that would be a bonus. Just kidding. <laughs> but it would be awesome. Okay, so I am Miriam Ingber. Thank you so much, Christine. It's been a, a huge pleasure and honor to get to work with Service to Schools. Um, every time I see a little Service to Schools in our Who Helped You With Your Application section, I get excited because they tend to be awesome applications. I read a couple today even, which was great, including some great ones. Um, so I am a YLS class of 2004. I uh, practiced law for a while after that and then came back to the law school after a, a stint at NYU. And yeah, I'm excited to be here, excited to be here with, uh, with Christy, my fabulous um, podcast co-host. <laughs> and yeah, we're looking forward to answering all of your questions and giving you some, some info on the application process and our respective institutions. And my name is Christy Jobson. I'm the Dean of Admissions at HLS. Thank you, Christine, for uh, putting this together. And thank you all for being with us. Um, and I'm always a pleasure to co-host with Miriam Pod on podcast, on video, any old place. Um, so I think we'll do, we'll, as Christine described, we're gonna do kind of a fireside chat, but we'd like to focus primarily on your questions for us. So just to, just to warm things up, we are going to kind of interview one another. We have some questions prepared, uh, including drawing on some of the ones that you submitted ahead of time. Um, and we thought we'd start with two really key opening questions. Why might you wanna attend law school? And why are law schools interested in you as veterans? So, you know, you may be here tonight because you want to be a lawyer and a JD is a necessary step in that process. But um, opening question for you, Miriam, beyond that basic concept, why might someone want to go to law school? So I don't want to step away too much from the basics because I do think it's important to remember that law school is a professional school um, and its primary purpose is to train people to be lawyers. So um, at, at Yale in particular, we talk a lot about many paths, many paths to YLS, many paths through YLS, and many paths after YLS. So our alumni do all sorts of, I think, amazing, crazy, interesting things. We have people in politics, in policy, in business, um, in the arts, um, all over really almost anywhere you look. But most of the people who graduate become lawyers of all different kinds. So I think you should think about law school if you're interested in learning about the law, if you're interested in being a lawyer, if you're interested in being a legal academic, um, or if you're interested in a career where being a loyal lawyer first might be a really, really helpful thing to do, even if it might not be where you want to be forever. Um, we see a lot of um, service members who end up in careers in things like national security, in government, in prosecution, um, in international law. But then some of them don't want to do any of those things. They say, okay, just because I did that in the military and maybe that's what I'm, I'm 
people might think at first glance, I'm qualified for, I'm done with that. I want to move on. And so we've had vets who go into tax law, into corporate law, um, into all sorts of things that may have nothing to do with their ser- their time and service. I was a biochem major and everyone was like, oh, you're going to go into IP, intellectual property. And I was like, I have zero interest in IP. So I think it's okay to really dream big when you get to law school to explore, to really see what piques your interest and to come in really open-minded. I think that's really important. Um, both of our schools are places that don't, don't have um, certificates or paths that are really laid out for you. They're places that are, are really opportunities to explore. And, and we like to call it choose your own adventure types of places. What do you think, Christy? What did I miss? I One thing I just wanted to pause on was the concept of not necessarily knowing what you want to do coming into law school and for that to be okay. So we often ask in interviews, you know, what sorts of legal interests might you want to explore while you're in law school? And I was talking with a professor who teaches a lot of 1Ls recently, and he was telling me about basically a, a speech he does at the, for all of his students at the beginning of his 1L contracts class, where he says, whatever you think you might want to do, set it aside just for a little while. Maybe you're going to come back to it. Maybe you're going to come back to it in a really big way. But for right now, leave yourself open to exploring. So I did a lot of work in securities fraud when I was a, a practicing attorney and a litigator. That was not something I candidly, maybe this, maybe maybe I should have known. That was not something I even really thought about going into law school. I didn't even know that that was a thing. And certainly I hadn't heard about the laws that I ended up writing about each and every day when I was drafting briefs. Um, And so I think that it's, it's, I think it's important to come into the law school experience with some sense of what you might want to think about, what interests you, what's pushing you towards this goal, but it's, but I, I hope you don't feel pressure to know exactly what you want to do or what types of jobs you might want to have in the future. And as, as Professor Bargill says, whatever you think you might want to do, try to set it aside for a little while and explore really broadly. Okay. So what do you actually learn in law school, Christy? Okay. So the classic response is law school teaches you to think like a lawyer. I remember going to info sessions like this one once upon a time and nodding along and be like, yeah, yeah, thinking like a lawyer. Of course, that's exactly it. It's everything I've wanted in life. But I, I'm not sure if I knew exactly what that meant back in the day. And I'm not always certain I know what it means now. But what I think people are getting at is the idea of it, frameworks and analysis and really thinking of looking at a problem and thinking about key components and how to break it down. There's a lot of multi-part tests that you'll learn about in law school. Um, there's a lot of procedures to learn about. Um, and in law school, you, you especially in the first year, I think you learn how to just work through problems, identify problems, articulate them, see how they map on to other concepts, um, see how they map on to other procedures, articulate different stakeholders and their places in the problem and how they might fit in. And then in law school, I I, um, I think, yes, the, the thinking like a lawyer, really honing your analytical skills is part of it. I wouldn't underestimate how much substance you learn in law school. And part of the point of learning substance is also just to practice different skills, but you will learn about different laws, rules, regulations, policy considerations that go into those laws, historical frameworks and concepts that undergird our laws, um, structures that constrain different actors in the system, what rights exist, but also what procedures and what processes you need to go through to enforce rights. Um, And then another thing I I know both of our schools really uh, emphasize is building skills, right? And a lot of those skills are not things you can learn in books, right? So I learned that it was very, very important um, to develop a, a good working relationship with the court clerk. If you were somebody who was going to drop off materials. Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court always had you actually file things in person. Um, and you they were right at 430 and you had to really, it, it was very, very important. There was a whole art to developing relationships with the courtroom clerks at the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. That was not something I, I you would have learned in a podium class necessarily, but through your clinical work, um, you do get to know like that all of those ins and outs and building relationships. How do you develop trust with your clients? Um, how do you repair trust if it's been broken with your clients? And, and a lot of that is a really important part of the clinical curriculum and in some ways infuses the rest of the curriculum as well. 
Yeah, I agree with all of that. And I think that balance between like the academic side and the practical side is really important. The one thing that I just want to like really emphasize that I don't think came home to me until I really practiced was the proceduralism that infuses the law, this concept of procedural justice. So there's the substance, but so much of what being a lawyer is, is ensuring that, and I think this might be true of, of the military to some extent too, that there's this, these procedures and practices and bureaucracy that ensures to, in a very deep way, fairness, um, or at least uh, an appearance of fairness so that the, the stakeholders, the people in the system can trust the outcome. They may not like it, they may not agree with it, but they know that the way the outcome was reached was fair. I think my years of litigating have really turned turned me into a proceduralist in many aspects of my life, making sure that everyone has been heard, making sure that everyone is treated the same, um, making sure that the rules are followed. Those things are really deeply important and really embedded in our legal system, or they should be embedded. And when they're when those things break down, um, it, things go bad very, very quickly. Uh, and understanding how those things are baked into the system, why they're baked into the system, the ways that they're not always right is really, really important. Uh, and that, that came really home for me through practice and through understanding the law in a really deep way. So you'll, you'll learn all that if you choose to go to law school and I hope all of you do. Okay, all right. I think we're gonna change topics a little bit now to what we're looking for. Yeah, so you, you may be interested in law school, um, but all, law schools, I'd say, are also really interested in you. Um, and sometimes people are surprised to hear that, I think. Um, people from all different backgrounds and pathways, but we'll focus tonight on veterans and active duty service members. Um, so zooming out, Miriam, why veterans and active duty service members often ask, you know, why do law schools recruit students with military experience? Why is this an important um, part of the class? Why is this a priority for us? And, and Miriam, how do you respond to that question? So I, I thought about this a little bit, and I think it's for two primary reasons. Um, I think one of them is the perspective that we get from um, service members in the classroom. I think that just the the experience of being in the military brings a really important and interesting viewpoint into the classroom because of the experiences that all of you have that are really different from what the average person has has had. Um, and there's all sorts of different elements to that. And that depends, of course, on the actual experience you've had. Obviously, the experience of someone who's been enlisted is different than someone who's an officer. The experience of someone who's deployed is different from someone who hasn't. The experience of someone who's in intelligence is different than someone who's an engineer. It, they're different experiences, but they're all really interesting and important ones. All of you have put something on the line for our country in a way that no one else really has. And that is different and important. And that viewpoint is a really critical one to have in the classroom when we're speaking in a really deep way. The law speaks in a really deep way to our country, how it's formed, why it exists, how it continues to exist. And that perspective matters a lot. In a much more selfish way, I think all of our faculty and all of us in administration know our vets make great student citizens. And I will quote one of my current students who Christine knows well. And I said to him, I was like, how's one L year going? Has it been an okay transition? And he literally said to me, he's like, well, no one's shooting at me, so everything's going great. And I was like, yes, you love it. You're so easy. They're so easy. They like it. They're happy. They enjoy things. They have been through things that are much harder than law school, and they're appreciative of what is offered. They're really often reveling in the experience of law school. Um, and we find them to be almost without exception to just be excellent community contributors and citizens. And that is something that um, is not true without fail of everyone else. Um, and so it's always like a deep pleasure to admit people who we know are going to be um, good community members. And we know that the people we admit um, who are service members will be almost without fail. And that's always, always makes it an easy decision. What did I miss Christy, if anything? Well, I'm just ruminating on um, a conversation I had with a another administrator who will not be named where I was like, I, last last year, I said, there are 24 vets in the 1L class. It's so amazing. And he goes, that's great. How about next time 560? Yes. My <laughs> dean says the same thing. She's like, the more, the better. And I see the question in there. So we were about mm, just we had eight last year with five deferrals. I was like most ever and then five of them deferred. So we had eight. We're going to be over that this year. I've already admitted a bunch. So we're, that's, that's going to be a number we're definitely beating this year. I can already tell. Yeah. Um, and I'd say also, I think employers really yeah. value having vets. Law school is not just about getting a job later, uh, but it is something to really consider. If you're feeling 
hesitant about this process um, and you're feeling nervous about outcomes, I, I don't want to be flippant, but don't be. Uh, the, every employer under the sun and judges, if you're interested in clerkships, I know we got one question ahead of time about clerkships, they, they are going to be very, very interested in having your perspective um, after you graduate from law school, just as we are for the time where you're in law school. Yeah. A lot of the law firms have diversity recruiting programs, and that includes vets, as well as other groups that they believe are underrepresented in the legal profession. Um, and they're very eager to hire to hire all of you. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about not just for vets, but in general, when we're reviewing applicants, what are the things that we're looking for? And I saw a question about like, how do the, the numbers, the quote unquote numbers play into that? So this might be a good moment, Christy, to, to wrap sure. that in. Sure, I can grab that one. Okay, so we're thinking first and foremost about your academic potential. So your potential to do the work in law school, to engage with the, the substance and the procedure that we were discussing earlier. And I kind of boil that down to two questions that we ask as sort of threshold questions when we're reviewing a file. Can you do the work? And will you do the work um, at Harvard Law School? I would say for the second question, typically with people who have military experience, we don't have a lot of concerns about whether you will do the work. Um, but we, we think a lot about that demonstrated academic potential. But it's, as I say, it's a threshold question, right? Those are opening questions you're asking yourself. Beyond that, you're thinking about what the candidate will add to classroom discussion, what the candidate will add to the discussion outside the classroom. Is this somebody who's going to be involved in the greater law school community? What perspectives will they bring to their clinical work and their work with clients um, that might complement other perspectives that we have in the class? Um, and then some broader concepts, initiative, um, people who are going to look at problems and issues that exist and think, how can I address this? How can I work with others? How can I work with my classmates to address this? Um, leadership potential in the classroom, out of the classroom, long, long after you graduate. I know both of our schools really prioritize leader, demonstrated leadership experience and leader, leadership potential. And then um, two things we've been thinking a lot about um, this year, at least in my team, is um, willingness to take risks. Um, take risks intellectually, take risks ac academically, um, and willingness to engage with others and interest in engaging with others. So some broad brushstrokes. How do the numbers fit in? I think that they, I think they are less important, at least for our two admissions processes, than people might think. There's calculators you can find online that purport to, you know, be a magic eight ball that tells you exactly what chance you have of getting in schools. And I just, just don't use those. They're like they, not good, especially for all of you who are very like unicorn-like applicants. So yeah. please don't focus on them. Yeah. I hate them. Not, I, I, I see the I see why people feel like there it might be reassuring. I, I see that how there's some categories of people who might feel like it's reassuring to have some sense of predictability, but I think you have to lean into the, this is sort of an unpredictable process in some ways, especially for, for schools like HLS and YLS. Um, and I, so I would focus more on developing just the best, strongest application package you can, and then try if you can, easier said than done, but try to mostly let it go from there. In terms of your ac academic performance in uh, college and undergrad, or if you have some graduate settings, is certainly important. Um, but I wouldn't think of it as it's harder to capture it in a number often because we are thinking about what courses you've taken, distance between college and law school, what different semesters looked like you're in your academic pathway. But it all really leads to those opening two questions. Um, the can you do the work and will you do the work? And beyond that, there's a whole lot more to you and a whole lot more to your application profile. So I'm going to add just a few tiny like like frills onto that. The, I agree with Christy on a lot of the things we're looking for. Um, the one other thing I consistently say that I think we really value, we want nice people. I do not have a big enough class to have bad apples in it. A few bad apples can really sour the barrel. I want people who are going to be good people, kind to others, respectful to their entire community. If I get a whiff that you're not that kind of person, that's disqualifying to me. Um, we can admit, uh, you know, we have a lot of people we can admit. We're always making really difficult decisions. I don't need people who are going to be arrogant and unpleasant, rude to others, think they're all that. 
everyone we admit is all that in my view, whatever their numbers and kindness, respectfulness, basic just goodness is a critical component for me. Um, and I, I, I value that, my faculty values that really highly. So that's, that's something I think is important. Um, in terms of, I saw a question, I think it came in earlier about, that I wanna talk that I think affects a lot of non, non-traditional, I hate that phrase, non-traditional applicants, but I think affects military applicants in terms of transcripts. Yes, a stronger graduate transcript or an upward trend, or if you went to college, then didn't do great, went off to the military, had a really good undergraduate after, of course we look at that. Didn't do so well in undergrad, had a great graduate transcript, of course we pay attention to that. Went to a service academy with like absolutely like insane grade deflation, of course we know that and we take that into account. Um, all those things we're very aware of, we're, we pay both of our processes, pay a ton of attention to the transcripts in a very nuanced way, which is why these calculators can be very rough tools because you know, we will admit people, in fact, we have admitted people with a 3.25 and there's a reason for that. That is an exceptional person who is coming with reasons why they're exceptional, not despite, but that 3.25 is part of the reason they're exceptional. So I think it's really important to, to look at yourself in a holistic way, the way we look at you. Um, so those are just some things just to be mindful of because we do see those patterns with many applicants, but especially with military applicants who tend to have much more complicated for some people than uh, not others, um, academic records. Okay. Awesome. All right, should we do some nuts and bolts? I love a nut, I love a nut and I love a bolt. <laughs> All right. Um, so Especially a cashew. That is my favorite nut. Yeah? <laughs> yes. I've been eating like ghost pepper cashews from Whole Foods. That's like, <laughs> I can eat three and then I have to have a cup of water. <laughs> so that's that's an aside, a frolic and a detour, if you must. I love it. All right. We love a nut and a bowl. We love a frolic and a detour. Exactly. Exactly. All, All right. right. So what are we would starting with? Would it be helpful with? to walk through the kind of key, a couple key components? Yes. Let's do it. Questions. Do you want to start resume? I can start resume. You do resume. All right. And I'll also say that we work through a lot of these components in our podcast. Um, maybe, maybe when I'm talking, Miriam, you can drop in the link to the podcast. Yes, I can do that. It's on Spotify. It's on um, Apple Podcasts. You can find it everywhere. Thanks. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that right now. Awesome. Okay. So let me t talk a little bit about resume. I think that the important thing with your resume is to help the reader understand where you've been and then it can give the reader a couple little hints about where you're going as well. And one, one thing I just want to drive home is chronology. The, it, what a reader is looking for, uh, Mary and I read 25 to 30 applications every day and your eye- to 50. Wow, you've done 50? Yeah. It's a bad day. I, I, need to, I, I max out. I did 200 in a weekend once my first year and it was, it was rough. It was a lot. <laughs> but you, you want to help the reader, right? So think about somebody who's reading your file alongside a lot of other files, and you don't want them to feel like they have to hunt to figure out exactly what happened when, right? So helping the reader understand when you went to undergrad, where you were, when, and how the chronology works. I know it sounds like a really simple concept, but it's probably the most, in my opinion, one of the most important things you can do in a resume. Make it easy for us. Make it easy. Yes. Um, and then also I think about it, helping the Here reader. are my fake eye drops that I have to use every day because like my eyes are so bad and dead from this. Like this is what, where we are. <laughs> They're great. So make it so easy for us. We're reading in volume all the time and the resume tells us the story in two pages. So tell us the story. Yes. My eyes. <laughs> And when you, when you have different, you know, headings are very important. Um, a lot of times people explain different jobs they've held some, sometimes not always some undergraduate extracurriculars they may have had different various experiences. Um, and that, that can be very helpful. Um, I know service school also provides a lot of guidance in terms of developing resumes and in particular translating military concepts to civilian readers. So I'll point to Christine and I know that she'll be a big help with that. Um, so that's, that's like a quick dive into resume. How about letters of rec, Miriam? Okay. I, I think letters of rec are really critical. I think both of our schools really prefer academic, what we call academic letters of rec, basically from people who've taught you in college or in grad school. 
that can get sometimes tricky. I know for all of you who might have been out of school for significantly longer periods of time than a traditional, you know, more traditional applicant. So that's totally okay. If you can get one, great. If you can get two, obviously that's ideal. If you can only get one, go with one. If you are getting, however, uh, a letter of recommendation from someone who you've served under, that can also be, th those are better than this than many professional letters, but I would really try to encourage them to the extent you're able to do that, to talk about the things that are more similar to what a professor would talk about. Um, analytical skills, critical thinking skills, leadership skills, those kinds of things, rather than something that feels like totally professional. Sometimes we get these letters and they're very um, either technical um, or as the phrase I stole from Christy that I really like about things that feel like table stakes, like this person was timely and punctual. Punctual. I've had people talk about this person dressed appropriately. All the, like just really like things that are basic, so basic that it actually undermines the work. Like if that's the person's expectations that that they're such a low level, ugh. Like it just it isn't good. Um, you want it to be things that are really high level analytical thinking, critical thinking, critical reasoning skills, research and writing, those kinds of things, if possible. I don't see that as largely a problem most often with the military letters. Um, often when you're getting them from a commanding officer type person, that's what they are. The more you can encourage that, however, the better. And do try to go back to school to get at least one letter if you can. All right, personal statements or these diversity statements. And I know we got a couple of questions ahead, Christy, yes. um, about whether when the, the diversity statement or this optional statement is necessary. And we got actually that question from a couple of different people. So I thought we could tie that one in. Awesome. I'll tackle personal statement first. Um, so your personal statement, to, first off, you should read every school's instructions very carefully because different schools ought typically have different expectations. For both Harvard and Yale, I think the personal statement, I'm going to set aside the Yale 250 and let Miriam um, talk about it separately. But for the personal statement, it's a very broad prompt. You can essentially write about anything. And in some sense, that's very freeing as an applicant. And in some sense that, that when the world is your oyster, sometimes that can actually be more challenging. Two pages, double spaced, normal sized font. It's not a lot of real estate to talk about all of your goals in life and um, everything you've ever done. So don't take the pressure off yourself. Tell us something that's about something that's really important to you, um, something that helps us understand your motivation for going to law school. Um, and I, one piece of advice I give to everybody is always make sure there's at least something in your personal statement that the reader could not find anywhere else on your application. So one sort of missed opportunity I at least see a lot is people who walk through their resume in their personal statement. And I think it's super well-intentioned. They're trying to help the reader understand um, their own, the applicant's professional path, but it can feel like deja vu. Like you just read the individual's resume. So yeah, it can feel sort of like, gosh, I really wanted to learn. I really wanted to dig into one of these experiences a bit more or learn a bit about this person's background and where they came from and what their hopes are. So again, always make sure there's something in that personal statement you can find anywhere else. For the question on whether and when to write a, a diversity statement, sometimes called an optional statement, um, again, not a lot of real estate, typically one page, two page short. Um, I think the important thing is to look at your entire application package and think about how to a potential diversity or optional statement would fit in. Is there something you haven't had the opportunity to share yet? And I know one question we got said that, that they felt like their narrative was really pretty clearly laid out in their resume and in their personal statement. If you feel like everything you've submitted kind of kind of covers it, don't feel pressure to submit an optional statement and a diversity statement. Sometimes it can actually detract from the application when you have an optional statement or that just feels like more paper and a little bit of a rehash of everything that's come before. So it's a tough call to make. I know there's always that feeling like you don't want to leave any opportunity on the table, but sometimes it's best to, to just step back and think about whether it makes sense to submit that optional statement alongside the others. So there. Um, Miriam, what do you have to add? So I agree with all of that. I'm not going to add much. I want to go back to a question I just noticed we got ahead of time about letters of rec that I failed to answer, which is about how recent they need to be, which I think is a great question. Um, so I, I want to rewind to that. Um, 
I don't think recency is the thing we care the most about. I think relevancy is probably the thing we care the most about. So it's totally fine to go back if you were in school five years ago to go back and get a letter from someone from then. I think that's that's better um, than not. So it's also fine to have a letter that you got from someone five years ago that you had banked all this time. Sometimes people will be really well prepared and they'll have a letter sitting with LSAC in their system for a few years and then they'll submit it or you you applied a few years ago, decided not to attend, and then you're just reusing an older letter. That is not an issue for us at all. That is um, what's most important is what is the person saying? How do they know you? Um, the content of the letter itself is what matters the most. Okay, so Yale 250, I'll do this super quickly. So for those of you who don't know, um, Yale has a, it's only 250 words. That's what we call it, the Yale 250. It is, a, it is a required short essay. It has a prompt, which is write about one idea or issue that's of particular importance to you uh, from related to your extracurricular academic um, or professional experiences. So the, the key things for this is it should be responsive. It shocks me how many people do not respond to that prompt <laughs> when we have a prompt. I, I would say at least 20% of the, the 250s I read are non-responsive. So that's really important. And you don't need to stretch it. It's a very broad prompt. So don't, don't stretch it outside of its terms. If you think it may not be responsive, it's probably not responsive. The two key things are idea or issue, and that idea or issue should be connected or related to your academic, professional, or extracurricular experiences. And then I think it's important to realize why we're asking this question. We want to know more about you. So the idea or issue you choose is very telling. And we want to make sure you can talk about ideas or, and issues in a sophisticated way, because that's what happens in our classrooms. People are talking and debating and discussing ideas and issues all the time. And we want to see how you do that. Jargon is bad. Jargon is not sophisticated. What is sophisticated is talking about things in a simple, clear way that raises interesting um, things that maybe the average person hadn't thought of before. Remember your audience is educated but non-expert. That is true of all good legal writing. You are writing for an audience who has gone to law school but probably doesn't know nearly as much as you do about the very specific topic at hand. So that's just a good way to think about your application as a whole including how you translate your military experience into the application. So that's a little bit about the 250. Can it, so there's a question here. Um, okay. Caleb, can the essay be longer than 250 words? No, that is non-responsive. <laughs> we don't count. So you could, and I probably wouldn't notice. I have a sense of what 250 roughly is. There is no part of me that is cutting and pasting every 250 into a word counter and checking it. I had one person who was so long looking that I did cut and paste it and it was 680 something words and I was really annoyed and offended. And it was, in a, I mean, there were other things that were bad about that application, but that was a big piece of why that person was not admitted <laughs> or a piece of why that person wasn't admitted. Do I know? No, if it's 256, I probably won't notice, but there's a rule for a reason. You know, we are, we are putting a constraint on purpose um, to see what you can do. And I will say as a litigator in federal court, there are very strict page and word limits on those briefs and your brief will be rejected if it is one word over the page limit, period. So you should get used to writing in a constrained environment. That is one of the reasons why we have a strict word limit. Um, I was the one of the, the champions at my nonprofit, when people had briefs that were too long, they would bring them to me and I would take out my red pen and I would slice and dice to get them under the, under the page limit. It is always possible to maintain the content and get the word count down. Um, so I, I'm a big believer that um, concision is a form of excellence in good writing. Often it's, it's more impactful with yes. a word count. Agreed. Yes. Um, all right, so should we go through some of the questions we got in advance or would you like to go through some of the questions in the chat? I think Christine's in charge. She's the boss. Yes, go for it, Christine. Yeah, I, I, there are some really great questions in this chat. Um, and I see that some of them have been directly answered, but there was a question earlier, earlier about deferring. So, hey, I'm getting out of the military. I'm on a unknown timeline. Should I apply now? and defer a year, um, what, is, what is your view on that? You know, how do you, how do you feel about a year where you all of a sudden have a ton of deferments? That's every year for me. <laughs> I, I feel like we, we traffic in a, in a like absurd number of deferrals every year. Um, 
my, my thought on deferrals is you should not apply to law school unless you think it's pretty likely you're going to be going to law school the next fall. We get that there's uncertainty and you have some lack of control over your end date in the military, and that's totally fine. I will never say no to a deferral when someone says, you know, my, the, the end of my service changed. They're telling me I can't, I can't exit. I will always grant that deferral. That's a little bit different than I had no idea if I could exit. You know, I, I it was, you know, 50-50 at best or, you know, less than 50-50. I took a gamble on it. You should have some sense. And if what you're, what you're hearing is looking pretty good that I'm going to be able to start next fall, definitely apply. Uh, if, if it's really, really uncertain, you might want to wait. But I think you know better than I think we do of what the level of uncertainty is. And, but we are always very flexible, as flexible as we need to be. Um, and, and last year, I think part of the reason we had so many military deferrals is that there was a, a, a tightening. Um, and there's a lot of people who are required to stay in for an additional year or two for various reasons. Um, and we had, a, we had a couple of people who had to defer for that reason last year, actually quite a number. We had, I think we had 16 military deferrals that we granted last year. Yeah, it was a crazy year for military deferrals. And we customarily, and I'm sure most every law school will customarily approve them. I guess the question, the important question to ask yourself is whether or not you're confident that you're likely to be able to go next fall. And I think it's partly, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it from the perspective of will I or will I not be granted a deferral. I would think about it more from, am I going to be in the best position to make a decision about which law school I attend next spring? Because if it's going to be many, many years from now, who knows, your, your goals may change. You might have a significant other who has geographic limitations. Uh, there's probably a lot of reasons to wait until you're pretty confident you'll be out the next fall. And there's also a difference between requesting a one-year deferral and requesting two years or more. Um, We don't grant ever more than three years, and two is generally our max. Um, So you should be thoughtful about the level of uncertainty and the length of time you might stay in as well. I want to answer this LSAT versus GRE question, because I think the GRE, one of the best things about the GRE when we started taking it last year is the number, I think that actually really increased our military applicant pool, which was one of the best sort of unexpected side effects of taking the GRE. Um, I think our official policy is we treat them both equally and that is in fact what we do. Um, I think it's important to be thoughtful when you're choosing between the tests. I sometimes wonder when I see someone who doesn't take the LSAT, like why? Like, is it because they're simultaneously applying to grad programs? Is it, you know, I, 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 I ask. I never ask that question in my head when it's a military applicant. I assume it's due to scheduling issues that it was a more flexibly scheduled test. So I think you should take the test um, that works best for you. So I, I would not worry about the test when you're in your position. I completely agree. I think if you, if you haven't yet made a choice about which test to take, maybe try out, a, there's plenty of practice questions you can find online, maybe kind of try them out. Think a little bit about timing, particularly if you have schedule constraints in the next couple months, which many of you probably will. Uh, maybe one or the other might might fit better with your schedule and kind of make the choice from there. And I'll also add there is no need to take both. There's no bonus points for taking both. Uh, no one's expecting you to submit both an LSAT and the GRE. Once you've taken the LSAT, that's kind of it. There's you that's, that's locked in. Like that's, we look at both because it's all data. So I'll look certainly at both tests, but then the LSAT sort of predominates a little bit in the analysis. Um, so once you've taken the LSAT, I would kind of just, for us, you don't even need to send us the GRE. If the GRE is way better than your LSAT, it can only help you. But if the GRE is weaker, you don't even have to send it to us. That may be different at HLS. You might request, you were still required. Yeah, we, both. we still require both. Yeah, we don't. So we only if you, require. If you've taken both. Yeah. We don't even require you to submit the GRE unless you choose. Um, if you're GRE only, if you've never taken the LSAT, obviously that's what we'll accept instead. So you should be mindful of those little nuances with different schools about, do you have to submit the GRE if you've taken it? But all schools, once the LSAT is on record, that is going to be something they care a lot about. Um, so I'm going to ask this question about financial feasibility. So, you know, law school is an investment. Um, if, you know, as veterans, most of us have the GI Bill, and then both of your schools, um, both of your programs offer yellow ribbon funding. But if, you know, a person perhaps doesn't have yellow ribbon or doesn't have the rest of their GI Bill, you know, what's your stance on picking 
one institution over another based on the, you know, the, the financial liability of it. And then also if you have any um, special uh, scholarships, grants, things like that through your universities, we'd love to hear about those as well. So you're you start? <laughs> sure. You're talking to the two law schools in the country that do exclusively need-based aid. We always say that Yellow Ribbon, of course, is sort of a, a different chunk. Um, it's kind of yeah, a Yellow Ribbon is actually the only exception we have. Right. They're not. It's like the it's tiny like, little exception we have, vocational rehab, Yellow Ribbon, um, all of that. It's the only exception we have to, to purely need-based aid. For Yellow Ribbon, both of our schools participate to the fullest extent. And um, Miriam, I'm probably right that Yale, like Harvard, has no cap. On no caps of any kind. Okay, so it's yellow into the fullest extent possible. That's that's for many of our students, a very, very straightforward way of funding their legal education. I'll also say that students, whether or not you were yellow ribbon eligible, all of our students are eligible for need-based aid. All of our students are eligible for our preferred lender program and various, and our summer public interest funding and various other programs that are in place. Um, but both Harvard and Yale do not offer what are called sometimes merit. Based, I kind of put merit in air quotes because I think there's so many ways to be meritorious beyond one's LSAT score, which is what the Scott my dean calls it by LSAT scores. Yes, it is that's mine. Schools, Have they had that chat? Yes, they've had that, that chat. Phrase. Well, yes, they've had that chat. Um, yes, that that yes. I, I have very strong feelings about this, as you can probably tell. Um, for us, need-based aid is a value of the school. We think it's really important with the financial resources that we have to use them um, to support students based on the equally based on need to try to bring them to sort of an equal financial point. Um, and we view every single person we admit as equally meritorious of being at the law school once they've hit the point of admission. And I think Harvard shares that value, uh, which is why we persist in having the only two school law schools left in the country with a purely need-based system. Our fee waivers are need-based. Our summer income um, public interest funding program is need-based. Our loan, We have an amazing loan repayment program, which is based on income after graduation. Absolutely everything we do is based on that principle that our funding and our resources should, should be going to equalize opportunities and try to create access for our students and graduates. And that is just like absolutely core to the values um, of the law school. Um, and I, I think it's really important. And I think we do a really good job of that. We're trying to do things to make that even better. Uh, and our, certainly our vets do get the benefit of the yellow ribbon program. We think that's really important, but in a way that is sort of a set aside from that general, uh, that general principle. And um, we have students who um, are on the funded legal education programs, the FLUP programs yes. to go into JAG. Um, we have a current 1L who's doing that. We have um, an obviously vocational rehab, which can be even more generous than the, uh, the GI Bill. We have students who participate in that and we provide a lot of support. That's a very bureaucratic and complicated program um, that we work hand in hand with students to maximize uh, the benefits from that as well. And I'll say in terms of deciding between different schools, it's a all of this said, I think both of our schools are really confident that we're doing the right thing by providing need-based aid, as well as our loan repayment programs post-graduation. I'm confident that you will repay your loans if you go to one of our schools. I'm confident that you will have career choice, but it is a very, it's, it's a really big investment and it's a big decision and it's kind of up to you. So I think for both of our schools, we when we're talking to admitted students, we talk through the opportunities, uh, but it's really up to you and it's your decision. And I don't think either of us would say one or the other decision is- hundred um, percent. It's yours. Yeah, almost everyone we admit receives a very significant merit scholarship or scholarships from other schools. And almost every admitted student I have, I talk to them and, and I don't think there's a right or a wrong choice in that. I think it's a very hard decision. Um, it's a decision I had to make. It's a decision almost every one of my admitted students has had to make. And it's, it's hard. It's hard. I think there's, a, there's no wrong decision. There's only the right decision for, for the person and for their family situation, for their personal choices, where they want to be after graduation, um, what's going to make them satisfied in the long run. Um, and uh, that's something that like, if you're admitted, you know, we usually connect people to current students or recent alums who've kind of like made a similar choice because uh, I think they're best placed to kind of walk through the pros and cons. Okay. Um, I, I have to scroll through these real quick, but I was looking at one question that said, that asked, um, 
you know, how do military veterans or national, if you are in national security, whatever it might be, how do you convey your desire to switch career paths as a part of your application? I think you just say it. <laughs> it's yeah, fine. I think it's kind of refreshing. I, you know what I mean? I, I don't think there's any reason. So I'm, I'm thinking of like one of our awesome, I think he's 3L now, um, who's who's like like super into tax. Like he, that's what he's, he's going to be a tax lawyer. Like he loves it. He's done it two summers now. He's going to go off to a law firm. He's a law firm job after graduation to be a, like at a big law firm in New York to be a tax lawyer. He w- does not present. If you met him, you would not, you know who I'm talking about probably Christine with the big beard. Yes. <laughs> yes, Christine knows him. He's amazing. He would not have presented, I think, at first flush is like a burgeoning tax lawyer in some way it's refreshing just the one note of caution I will say and I would say this not just um to to service members is something else we're looking for in applicants is like a sense of authenticity and the best way to kind of make that not all up in the air is a feeling of, of showing not telling so if there's a big gap between everything you've done and the things you think you might want to do the way to avoid that feeling inauthentic is to be a little vague about it so the usual example i give is the person who like everything they did in college was like corporate business whatever student business society consulting whatever and then they're like and i want to be an international human rights lawyer and you're like Hmm, maybe true, doesn't feel authentic. So if everything you've done is very much, you know, in the military presents as like, you know, possibly national security and you're like actually tax law, totally fine to say that, but I would just vague it up a little bit. You know, I'm not totally sure where my interests lie. However, I have a strong sense that I might be interested in corporate law, possibly tax because of the complex intellectual puzzles it brings. Unless you've done things like volunteer as, you know, a tax preparer, you know, you've been in one of those programs where you can really tie it to some specific work, in which case you're showing not telling. And then you could say, you know, based on my work as a volunteer tax preparer for low income individuals, I found that work so intellectually stimulating, I can't wait to learn more about it. And I feel like my my future lies in tax. So there's, you know, that's like a careful path to kind of walk. It just shouldn't feel like a throwaway at the end. I often get to an end of a personal statement and someone's like, and also climate change. And you're like, what? And as as Mary says, like, like, maybe true, right? Like maybe true, but I... I, I think also I wouldn't underestimate the, uh, just take some reflection time to understand why you have this particular interest and, and sort of where it comes from. And it doesn't necessarily have to be anything in your professional life or your military career. It could be something very personal um, and that that can be helpful or don't force it. You know, there, no, you don't have, I think sometimes pe- people feel a lot of pressure to have that end of the personal statement where they say, and this has all led to my interest in international human rights law. It doesn't have to. You, you don't have to have an interest that you express. You can just want to go to law school. That's totally fine too, in general. Like that's, that's totally okay at this point as well. Yeah, I, I think that's very helpful. Yeah, I think everyone feels the need to explain why they got out of the military. And hey, maybe you joined the military so you could go to law school. So you had the GI Bill. Or maybe you, you wanted to have a career and make some money and like, you know, do a thing be- like, or because your your parent was in the military. Like people do things for so many reasons that are complicated and personal. And like, it's a, like we get that. We really do. Um, yeah, I so I think... I sometimes want to do a survey of like what people said they wanted to be in their application and then survey them like two years after to see how many of them changed. And I think it would be like 80% are not doing what they said. You know, and so, that's okay. And that's that's exactly okay. What the professor said, take it, set it aside. Take it. it it's okay. Back. Yeah. You don't need to force it. And we all know you're probably, many of you are going to change your minds and we, we, we don't care. That's totally fine with us. Christine, I see two questions that I view as related that I kind of love. Yeah. Um, one of them is about mentoring programs for students. And the other one is from someone who is a first gen student, which is like not having knowledge about what they need to know and about support systems. And I sort of view those as interconnected. And I just wanted to maybe say something about, about both of those things. Cause I think both of our schools um, care deeply about mentorship and also care deeply about access and supporting first gen students. So I'll, I'll just say a little bit about why LS has, and I know um, HLS has a lot of things as well. So this is like a particular priority for Dean Gherkin, who's the Dean at YLS. Um, 
I think in part because of her own personal background, um, I think she experienced like when she became Dean, one of her top priorities was sort of increasing the supports that we had in place for first gen students and increasing mentorship for all students. So we have a really, really active, we call it FGP first gen professionals group, which is for students from, we call them FIGLI, first gen low income, first gen college, first gen professional students. They're really active in terms of community building, but also in terms of doing advocacy work around these kinds of issues. They're awesome. Um, a lot of the students in that group work with admissions and work with all sorts of other administrators on on and they work with me a lot on financial aid, which I really like. Uh, Dean Gherkin, one of the things she did with my really close colleague, Sharon Brooks, they launched what we call Courtyard, which is um, basically LinkedIn only for YLS students and alums, and it is designed to be a mentorship platform. Um, it's um, It's been amazing. Like we have thousands and thousands of people in it. It just launched eight, less than I want to say less than a year ago, maybe a, just over a year ago. So we, I have like one 3L who has gotten jobs through it. She's gotten informational interviews. She wants to be a public defender in Southern California and she uses it to just network and she's been able to find all sorts of things. Uh, I've talked to tons of current students who say they use it in that way. And, and she's, she's very first gen. Um, she's first gen college and she's found it to be a really powerful networking tool which is exactly why Dean Gherkin created it so there's sort of these way of embedding these structures to provide support and I'll just give one more example of sort of like a top-down effort to provide this kind of support to first gen students and, and then maybe I'll just mention a couple of other mentorship programs very briefly we just launched a safety net fund in the spring which is an emergency funding program for students who are more financially precarious when they come across unanticipated financial hardships to provide them with support and that was again one of Dean Gherkin's like major priorities uh, with a special eye for first gen students so we have Dean's advisors for our 1Ls which are sort of uh, meant to be sort of just adjustment to law school advisors. We have um, COCRA fellows who are meant to be more academic advisors. We have a small group, which is a 1L seminar with less than 20 people, which is sort of your main academic cluster, your 1L year that you do all your classes with, with a professor assigned to it. Everything is sort of structured around easing the entry into law school. And then all, all of our affinity groups, including the VETS group, have these like big SIB, little SIB programs. There will just be like a multitude of ways to find those kinds of supports. Um, one of my 1L said that she has too many she has too many big SIBs and she's on the older side. And she's like, and I'm older than all of my big SIBs. <laughs> that was really cute. But she said it's amazing. She said she like can't even keep up with all the like checking in, like how are you doing, like can I be helpful kind of email she's been getting from all of the the big sibs she's sort of been assigned and all the the mentors and you know people who've been assigned to her. So in some sense, it's it's sort of like a, a fire hose of mentorship and support, and people choose from that what's helpful for them. And I'm sure. HLS has very some probably different but similar arrays. Yeah, that. so I'm going to drop into the chat. We have a mentoring and advising website that I'll put in. So each of our incoming students has five assigned advisors. They have two faculty advisors, two peer advisors, and an alum advisor. Um, you can read more about that there. Um, your two faculty advisors, one is your section leader. So all of our incoming students are divided into seven sections of 70 to 80 students each. And there's a section leader who teaches you during your 1L fall and also acts as one of your key advisors throughout the 1L experience. Your second faculty assigned advisor is your reading group instructor. So all of our 1L students are in reading groups of between five to 10 students. Um, you, uh, you select your reading group based on areas of academic interest. So typically your reading group professor is one that kind of lines up with something that you at least think you're interested in at the, at the time. And that's your second assigned faculty advisor. For there's three main peer advising programs. One is the Board of Student Advisors. That's the legal research and writing teaching assistance as well as kind of academic advisors. Second is your section connect match. So we have a program called Amicus. Uh, it launched in 2018, very similar to what Miriam described with Courtyard. It's like LinkedIn and Facebook for Harvard Law School um, students and alumni. Your section connect match is matched through the Amicus system based on someone who is in your section in a prior year and had all the same professors. So if you're in section three, um, your section connect match is a 2L or 3L from section who was in section three. And then you're someone who shares your professional interests. And then you, then you have an alum advisor that match, that's matched through Amicus as well. Um, so those are that's kind of an outline for first year students. I'll also highlight our peer advisor program. So peer advisors 
are uh, three L's. There's usually 20 to 30 of them that are selected and very specially trained to be uh, to help you live well and be a fully lived person in the law. Um, a good number of them are um, first gen students. Um, and they are available to the entire student body. They're not necessarily assigned um, and they do a whole lot of different community building. I'll also highlight our, our um, affinity group for first gen low income students is called First Class. And here's a very, or at least like I think a very beautiful feature about First Class. It's um, only for first generation college students and students from low income backgrounds. Um, and is one of actually one of the largest affinity groups at HLS. So there were 83 incoming students this year who identified as first gen and or from a low income background and over 250 members of first class in the student body. Um, I will also put uh, there, I, I would recommend for a lot of these student organizations, following them on Instagram, because um, a lot of our student orgs are super active in Instagram and it gives you a sense of how they talk to each other. So I'll drop that in the chat as well. Awesome. And follow service to school on Instagram. Um, okay, so I'll, I'm going to ask more of a tactical question about timelines. So the question is, when is the best time to apply? So knowing that you all are already reading applications, um, can you talk a little through that? And then also, you know, timeline, maybe this is for a veteran that's getting out. What about a timeline for a veteran that's currently in undergraduate? What does the timeline look for him or her? I think it's, this is another one where it's really up to you. I'm going to give a very unsatisfying answer. I think if you're ready, if you are in your last year of undergrad and you're ready to go to law school next fall and this is the right time for you, you should apply now. If you have, you're, you're not certain law school is the right next step, um, you've got more things you want to be doing, you can wait and apply. Law school will be there when you are ready. So think more about when you are ready. In terms of timeline within the cycle, I think um, we've, we've published a blog post. We're waiting until January to make any admissions decisions. We're trying to keep it very slow and steady this year. Um, and I, in any year, and especially in this year, wait until you're ready. Wait until you press submit on your application and you feel really confident that you've given it your best effort. There's much, it's much better to submit a stronger application later than to feel rushed and to submit an earlier application under some timeline that someone arbitrarily told you is early. Um, there is no, I, I know for other schools, there's actual early decision and maybe different rounds. Um, sometimes there's a lot of talk on the internet of like what's considered early for a school and most of it is not any, it, it's like not parlance that actual admissions officers use yes. wait until you're ready. <laughs> yes. Um, for us, the timing does, we've already started admitting, so we're in the process of it, but ironically, or maybe oddly, um, the timing matters even less for us than it does for any other school. Um, you, could, you can apply on day first or day last, and your chances of admission are identical, and that's because of the way our faculty review process works. Um, if you make it through sort of a first round read by me or someone on admissions, you move into faculty review. And those are batch reviews. So we'll send X number of files to a group of three faculty members. They score those files on a strict curve that remains consistent throughout the cycle. Um, so really you're being compared to the people in that same batch, which is a little arbitrary. And the faculty members who are getting your file is kind of random. So, but that's your pool at that point. And that's a curved, a very strictly curved thing. Depending on the score that comes back from that, that depends whether you end up admitted, not admitted, or waitlisted. Um, so it kind of doesn't matter if you're in a faculty batch right at the beginning or right at the end, your chances of being admitted out of the batch stay consistent. So as Christy said, you should definitely apply when you feel your application is ready to go. Um, it will affect the timing of when you're admitted, uh, and but it's not going to affect for us the chances of if you're admitted. And truly, everybody in a 1L class starts 1L orientation on the same day. No one goes around and is like, oh, wow, I was admitted in February. or It just doesn't, it doesn't it matter. It makes no difference. And very, very importantly for both of our schools, you're equally eligible for financial aid on the exact same basis, no matter when you are admitted. So I know that that can be kind of a concern with some other schools. We give the exact same financial aid package to the very last person admitted off the wait list than, than they would have gotten if they were the very first person we called months earlier. Exactly. 
All right. Well, we are at time. I know there was a little bit of confusion with Zoom time zones in the original registration. Then I, I, it looks like a couple of people just joined at 630. So I just want to reassure everyone that we will send this recording to everybody that registered. Um, but thank you all for showing up. Um, really huge thank you to Christy and Miriam. This is like a real treat and, you know, pleasure and like we're so fortunate as veterans to have kind of like access to pick your brain um and i wish everyone good luck with applying this year or next year or whenever it might be and any any famous last words we hope you apply um and listen to our podcast <laughs> i just put my email into the chat but it's really just first name dot last name i mean my first name and my last name at yale.edu <laughs> Um, I wonder how many people are emailing first name dot last name at yield.edu because I say that all the time. So it's in the chat. Um, and if you have questions that come up, and I know there may be questions, you can feel free to reach out. Um, you can email our main admissions email address as well. It's monitored all the time. Um, and we really want to be helpful. We really want you to apply. We really want to have um, your voices at our, in our communities. So definitely, definitely let us be helpful to you. That's, um, that's why we do our jobs, because we like doing that <laughs> and yeah we're, we're really eager to to be a support to all of you we're happy to put you in touch with our current students we're happy to answer your questions and yeah we wish you a, really the best 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 of luck with what we know can be a stressful and not super fun process and thank and you everyone have a good yes you're welcome organizing um, we really appreciate it of course anytime and everybody on this call reach out to your services school ambassador, drop us a note if you need anything and have a great evening. And thanks again to YLS and HLS. Thank you. Bye.